Hey friends, I want to welcome our new sponsor, Laird Superfood. As a type 1 diabetic myself, you know I'm always interested in stories and products around nutrition, and I really like the idea of functional nutrition in a small scoop. Laird Superfood all started when big wave surfer Laird Hamilton shared his functional coffee with his friend Paul Hodge. Paul tried his special blend, and he knew that Laird's incredible coffee recipe needed to be made available to everyone, and they launched the original Superfood Creamer in 2015. What happened was Laird started experimenting with his morning ritual about two decades ago, and he found that when he started adding fats to his morning cup, like coconut oil, that he had energy throughout the rest of his day. He eventually perfected his recipe for an epic cup of fuel and started sharing it with friends in the surf community. Now, all Laird products are sustainably sourced and thoroughly tested to ensure that you're incorporating the cleanest, finest fuel into your routines. And again, as a diabetic, I appreciate no sugar from highly refined corn syrup. There's no artificial flavors, colors, or additives. Are you ready to feel more energized, focused, and supported? Go to LairdSuperfood.com slash Hansel Minutes and add nourishing plant-based foods to fuel you from sunrise to sunset. Use our promo code Hansel Minutes at checkout to save 15% off your purchase today. Hi, I'm Scott Hansel, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today, we've got a really exciting show. We're going to talk about Visual Studio Code. With me today, I've got Kai Metzel, Partner Director of Software Engineering, and Eric Gamma, Technical Fellow at Microsoft. How are you, gentlemen? We're great. How are you? Pretty good. I'm very well. This is really exciting to chat with you. I am a fan of both of your work, uh, and I've worked with you peripherally. Uh, Eric, folks might know you, of course, from your work in design patterns in the early 90s. And uh, Kai, you're managing engineering across Visual Studio Code. You've been there since the beginning of VS Code. So what I wanted to do in this podcast here is understand how this happened. Because for some people, Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio Code came out of nowhere. And it felt like within a day or a month, we went from it didn't exist to 20 million users. And I want to understand, like, back up in time before 2015, 2014, when, when did someone start thinking about this? Where, where did the, the concept come from? Because there was a time when there was a thing called Sublime Text, and now that's not a thing. And Visual Studio Code t- took over. So uh, I'm not sure who to ask first. Who was there first, Kai and Eric? Eric was first. So it all started in, in 2011, right. which is oh, over wow. 10 years ago. Yeah, and that's why we sometimes say VS Code an overnight success, ten years in the making. Right, and it was really quite a journey because the first public appearance of VS Code happened in 2015, and before that, we did quite some ground tech work, right, in web technology and so on. It took us a long, a lot of technology explorations to get there where we are today. Was it a plan, though? Was there a meeting where, where someone said, we need an editor? So I joined Microsoft in 2011. And uh, the question was, now I always said, I, I don't look for a new job. I look for a new challenge. And then I talked to uh, the leaders in DevTools. And the challenge they thought they could give me is online developer tools. This was the message, right? And from there on, basically... There was continuous retooling, right? Because our mission was to run like a startup. And the first thing we built was the Monaco editor, because as a startup, you want to have customers. You want to have people that depend on you to be relevant. And that's why we invested heavily in the Monaco editor to make this a great web editor that you don't know you in a browser, explore your new web technology, web workers, and so on. And yeah, but you're more ambitious than the Monaco editor, right? We, uh, you want to do dog foods to the max, and that's why you have not only built the Monaco editor, you have also built kind of an ID in the browser with an explorer, with source control, with terminal, and so on. This all happened before and 2015, the first public appearance of the VS Code preview. What was happening in that four years there between 2011 and 2015? You were just refining the editor, making sure that the editor and the, the buffer, the core experience was, was, was correct. But you were also collecting, quote unquote, customers. People were using Monaco and embedding Monaco. Right. So 
we dog fooded since 2011, right? That's the first thing we did. We got dog food and then we built the web ID and we had on the past to 2015, we had the idea, yeah, we built a web ID for editing websites. That's what we did. And, uh, even made it available, right? That's, it was announced as Visual Studio Online Monaco, which uh, we demoed, I guess, in 2014 uh, at an event. Mm-hmm. And from then on, though we were, re- as a startup, we looked at how impactful it is. We had some lovers, but not that many. Right. With 3,000 3, users and Microsoft, you're not having an impact, right? And then we just like a starter, we pivoted and decided not build a web ID, build a desktop ID. Mm-hmm. Because the nice thing is Microsoft changed significantly, right? Cross-platform all of a sudden became a core. It's not only Windows anymore. And of course, we had web technology. Browsers run on every platform. So we get to cross-platform. And that's what is the most important pivot. And from then on, we ship every month. And from then on, we continuously tune what we do and try to address challenges. Mm -hmm. Now, Kai, the source code was released in November 2015. You came to Microsoft after working for many years for uh, for yourself and then for IBM. Uh, You show up four months later, so you're still there very, very at the early times. Were you a user or a fan? Were you watching these announcements and then you're like, I have to go work there? Or uh, you know, how, how did you come in just a few months after the source code was released? So Eric and I have been knowing each other for a long time. So I met him first time in 1992 as an intern. So I started interning and Eric was one of the people on the team. And uh, so long history, we worked together in, in IBM. Um, and we even met, I actually came to, to Switzerland talking to him about, about his move to, to Microsoft at the time. So, you know, we were always... Um, uh, Kai wanted to convince me to join his startup. Sorry, Kai. You, you wanted to convince me when you joined Switzerland to join, to join your startup. I see. So then Eric convinced you to join his startup. That actually is pretty much how it, how it <laughs> worked, right? So a while later, it was pretty much exactly like this, right? We, we talked on and off about what was happening, and he asked a couple of questions, how I was developing, what tools I was using, and, you know, all these kinds of things. And, and, and then at some point, he said, look, this is what we have, right? And we have this hunch that this could be something that 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 really will grow, but I cannot do it myself. So come join us. Let's make this big, right? And that's pretty much how why I came. And the the size of the team is like relatively small for something so influential. Um, I think as of last year, the last numbers that I have were twenty eight engineers, six PMs, three UX, and a writer. This is not a team of hundreds of people, but it is a community of thousands of people. So, what's the actual number of coders here? You said twenty eight engineers. How much of it's coming from the open source community, Kai, and how much of it's coming from internal to to Microsoft? So, by far, the largest amount comes directly from the team itself, Mm -hmm. right? We, we have a whole, we have a good set of PRs, for example, that come in on an ongoing basis, right? But the largest amount of code by by orders of magnitude comes from the team. Um, that of course, right, should not discount at all what kind of ideas and inspirations we actually get from, from the community, right? Because we have hundreds of hundred thousand and something issues or, you know, that are in the repo. Uh, we have a whole bunch of extensions that we own that are in the marketplace and so on, right? That have their own repos. And the ideas you get from people, hints you get how to do particular kinds of things in code, for example, that are in cre- incredibly valuable. I remember a situation on Windows, for example, where we, we had this one problem we could simply not figure out how to do. Right, and then uh, a Czech developer came, and she pretty much pasted the lines of code, saying, "Here is how you do this, and this is fixing the problem." And it did, and so it was, yeah, it was, it was great. One of the coolest uh, collaborations that I seen uh, was this bracket pair colorization where someone creates an extension that colors brackets. And then when you have deeply nested brackets, this starts to become a problem. We start seeing some perf issues. 
and it's kind of a uh, extensions are being created to make this better. But then at some point you all decided that this bracket colorization is a really important thing. Who dug into the perf? Because the blog post is unreal. It says 10,000 times faster. And that was such a fascinating story to read. And it seemed like it was a kind of an interesting back and forth between the community and, uh, and the extension creators. So you know what? We care a lot about uh, performance. And one problem is we run extension in a separate process, which is a single thread scene, right? It's a node process and we load all the extensions in there and they run it there. And we get the, we, me- we measure, you know, when the extension is not responsive. And what we found is that often when the extension is not responsive, because this bracket pair colorization is so popular, people have a bad lagging experience. And this kind of triggered the whole thing. You no know, bracket pair colorization is great as a technology user seems to love it, but it hurts our tool because we run it in a single threaded extension host, which kind of stops the responsiveness of other extensions. And then we started the initiative looking what we can do. Can we do it by just if board ETI? That was the discussion, right? Which would be the most natural way because we always expand our API to make extensions better. That's our story, how we grow the API. Does it make our extensions better? So we tried that. But in that case, it was so hard. What you would have to expose to API, which we don't want. Then at the end, we decided to move the algorithms into the core of VS Code. And then we look at different things. And then the algorithm, you have read the blog post, which is, which is a great read. It shows we all the algorithm improvements we made to make this fast. And on the very large monster file, not the monster file, we always use file benchmarks for large file, is, is at checker.ts from the TypeScript compiler that does the type checking. And on that, I think that's where the measurement is 10, 10 times, 10,000 times faster than the other one. Yeah. And then was a whole transition flow to get the community kind of migrate from the extension over to our built-in one. Like this was a lot of, yeah, called community management was involved there, right? An interaction. Because yeah. you want to give credit to the big innovator, but at the same time, we don't want to appear we just stole their idea. So that's what a lot we want to do. And the way we did it by transparency, right? We discussed all of that in, in, in the issue. Yeah, exactly. And that transparency is really at the heart of what you all are are doing in, in in your community interactions. One of the other things that I think is really amazing is the uh, I, I don't know how to phrase it. Maybe the kind of the, the multiplicity or the Cartesian product of the complexity of what's going on here. Because this is not just an editor; it has an abstract syntax tree of an understanding of languages to do colorize colorization. But then plugins for the language may have their own abstract syntax trees. You support effectively every language, right? Like, is there a language you don't support right now? Uh, and how are you making it all work, not breaking it, Kai? How does it not break one of these Cartesian products of complexity from a month-to-month basis? So I, I think in the, at the very bottom, right, it's the architecture, how everything comes together. It's the APIs we provide, the stability of the APIs. Right, that our the nature of the API. So the APIs, for example, are all data driven, right? Which actually means we control pretty much the control, you know, pretty much the whole control flow, the presentation of it, the user interactions, and so right. Uh, then when you talk about the the languages, for example, right? We have when you look at the extension API itself, we have different aspects pretty much of extension or of, of language integration, right? We say you can be a completion provider, you can be a folding region provider, you can be, you know, all formatting providers, all of these kinds of things, right? But then there was a really interesting move actually, my own was that maybe 2016, 17, right? When we were thinking about that extensions need to be close actually to the or in language extension needs to be close to the actual ecosystem it comes from, right? So like, for example, Python language, people r- like to write their language libraries in Python themselves and Go people like to write it in Go. And, so. and that is pretty much when we started bundling some of the ideas in the extension API together to the language server protocol, right? And that is actually a protocol that in any kind of binary can implement. 
And then we really just have a, a shallow adapter, pretty much in VS Code itself, that maps the VS Code API to the very similar language server API. And and those kinds of things actually can can coexist very well. Right? Mm. Hey, friends, I want to take a second and thank our sponsor, Zencaster. You know that I've been doing Hansel Minutes now for over 850 episodes. And in the old days, I would have a guest manually install Audacity and they would FTP their WAV file to me. And it was a mess. But for the last several hundred episodes, I've been using Zencaster. It's an all-in-one podcast production suite. It runs entirely in the browser. It's got but now video, HD video. It's got built-in voice chat. I do footnotes. I've got a soundboard for live editing. It's absolutely brilliant. And it also uploads to my cloud. The guest shows up, they go to a URL, they record, and the next thing you know, in my Dropbox or my cloud storage, a file appears. It's absolutely brilliant. And they've even now got automatic transcripts. And they are now sponsoring the show. And you can go to Zencaster, Z-N-C-A-S-T-R.com slash pricing and use my code HanselMinutes and you'll get 30% off your first three months of Zencaster Professional. I want you to have the same easy experience that I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story with Zencaster. I don't want to fanboy too much, but one of the truly most extraordinary things about Visual Studio Code that I think not enough people know about is the location transparency and the ability to remote the language server into a container, into WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux, or code spaces. Was that always the architecture to be able to split VS Code in half to a client server? So there is, that was a long-term effort, right? This whole transparency effort uh, took us around two years. And it really came out of the need. We saw more and more people wanna don't want to have source code on, the, on their laptop. People use things like WSL, where you basically want to run the tools uh, on the Linux side, but not on the Windows side. But the UI, you still want to run locally. And this um, resulted in kind of evolving the idea of having an extension host process to support a remote extension host process. And this was then where we benefited from the API transparency, right? An extension doesn't have to know where it runs, which gives us this big win, right? That basically it's almost, yeah, you can do Python in WSL, you run on WSL, and we don't have to do any pass map, right? Before we had that, imagine you run things on Linux, but the UI is on Windows or the Mac. You have to pass that don't match and whatever, right? So this was a big benefit. Then you started the whole remote story, right? With the dev containers, SSH, and now tunnels. It's absolutely extraordinary. Like I feel like I'm telling people about it every day because they know about VS Code, they use VS Code every day, and then they discover remote and they go, oh my goodness. And then their brains explode and they can go and explore the VS Code server. But, but Scott, Scott kind of had one, it's cool, right? Local extension host process, then remote extension host process, and now what we also have with kind of VS Code Dev, we can run extension, the extension host process in a web worker, right? Which is a little bit fascinating because one is the browser API and the other one is the node API. And thanks to the quality of our API, a data provider, as Ty mentioned, right? Many of these things are possible um, also by just having the browser only without a backend or a virtual machine or container that runs the whole thing. So this was a nice evolution of this architecture from a separate extension host and a strong API. This this may be an ignorant question, but has how does that how are you thinking about where WebAssembly comes into this? And if someone were to go and implement something with WebAssembly, it's just about making sure that that lollipop that that API matches up. Could they could they do that, or how would that change your web worker extension host? Very good question. So the we actually have been looking into WebAssembly. And uh, so it first started out by saying, uh, can we actually have certain runtime experiences in the browser, right? And the need actually came out of what Eric just mentioned, that we can run VS Code, including the extensions in the browser, right? But then you clearly don't have a terminal. You clearly cannot run your code, right? And then there were efforts like, for example, Pyodide, right? This is a, a, 
a Jupyter stack that you actually can run in the browser itself. And then it was like, well, can we run actually Python in general or can we do something else there? So that was the beginning where we actually looked into how to bring these uh, runtimes in. And then we actually faced this really interesting challenge, which is now if you are actually a runtime extension, you still want to be able to read files, write files, and so on. And those files actually should be the files that the uh, that are visible in your workspace, right? So when you actually say run, right, then you the interpreter, the Python interpreter that runs in WebAssembly needs to read those bits, right? Um, so that actually then pointed to us to, well, we need to bridge pretty much some pieces that are already existing in our extension API, like, for example, access to the file system, right? We need to make that work. And then you have this interesting role to bridge and actually WebAssembly people face that in, in many ways, right? Where WebAssembly is pretty much synchronous because it's sitting based on POSIX, right? And everything that we have done in our world is asynchronous, right? And so we needed to pretty much invent something that allowed us to pretty much bridge this gap between synchronous file calls, right, map to asynchronous file reads that we implement on our site and then actually bring it back. And the very moment we did this, right, then we pretty much realized the saying, this is pretty much a path where we can imagine in the future that we give a portion of the, of the API so that you can actually run your extensions Right, extensions that you would have to write today in TypeScript or JavaScript directly, right? That you potentially can go and write it, you know, in Rust if you want, right? And then bring it down. The the challenge there is though, uh, just to call this out, right? Our extension API, the way it is structured, makes some assumptions about that it actually lives in a TypeScript world, right? That's the typings, the synchronicity, and so on. So actually having a similar kind of API mapped into Rust would be extremely challenging. So I would not say that this will be exactly the same or even the same scope. It might be a subset that we make available so that you can write certain kinds of extensions in WebAssembly. One of the uh, the early promises was to be able to do VS Code on something like an iPad, and I've tried that many different times, and it feels like it's close to being there. But do you bump up against limitations in what the browser, in this case, mobile Safari, is going to allow you to do as far as key binding and being able to do the hotkeys that you want? And is that a is that a reasonable thing to even wish for? Do I want to use VS Code in in Safari? What do you think, Eric? Well. Once we went to the web, right, access, anywhere access is the immediate step you think about. Okay, now we can run in the web. Can I do my pull request review from an iPad? And yes, we have this goal, but we continuously invest in that. But there's still kind of some limitations and uh, some problems we hit. Of course, the first problem you is when you run in the browser, right? When key bindings, the browser takes some key bindings you want. Things like that. And it's kind of, it was kind of a story, I think, with iPad support. We tried also, Kai, I don't know how, since how many, since code spaces, right? We try it, continuously improve it. Yeah, so the, the our web experience will be as code, right? Uh, debut with, uh, with code spaces, right? That was the first time it was visible, right? GitHub code spaces. And uh, the, the challenge there was that... Uh, as you mentioned, right, the uh, the key bindings showed up. We had to make certain architectural changes to make it work in general. But overall, um, iPad was still something, right, particularly from from the GitHub audience, right, that, that people really, really wanted it. And so some limitations in Safari, right? A lot of people say Safari is a new Internet Explorer, right, from what APIs it's actually supporting and so on, right? So it's, it's lagging behind. But then there's also some really interesting kind of challenges in the way of how certain events are handled, what events are actually passed through, what events are being missed, and, and so on. And that is actually something that is not super easy to fix on our side. We actually need support from Apple there. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we are lucky, let me put it this way, and we have an issue and then Apple just comes and fix it right away. And then there are other issues that are open for a couple of years and nobody really does. Right, and that makes it hard to have a really enjoyable experience on the iPad. Right? 
So we still have, for example, some focus handling challenges, right? So that you want to scroll one view, but it doesn't work because some other widget on your screen needs to have the keyboard focus in order to make that scrollable, right? Which is really awkward. But so, yeah, well, I would love to get this really right. So if you hear somebody on the podcast from Apple listening, reach out. We give you a list of all of the the issues we need to make that really work on the iPad very well. That would be great. That would be great. One of the really significant things uh, about VS Code is the speed at which you are shipping and the fact that you have collective ownership on the team. Um, is it true? You're, are you shipping every day or twice a day at this point? Every day, with the exceptions, by shipping multiple times a day. So we, we have read like, like a lot of other products. We ship nightly uh, versions of, of VS Code is called Insiders, right? That's the Microsoft terminology. So that is our nightly version. Uh, we use it every day to develop ourselves. Uh, we break it sometimes, right? It, like, for example, just today, uh, in certain situations, the SKP d didn't work. So right, we fixed that. An hour later, we had a new Insiders going out that actually had the fix in it. So that's that. Sometimes we ship, as I said, multiple times a day, and then we ship monthly, right? Those are our monthly releases. Um, that uh, the naming conventions the, the people love because we ship in early April the March release, and and we're not going to change this. This is you know our trademark. We only ship. Important point here is we do that ship every month since eleven year. That's just. Since we started 2011, we did that, and we're still doing that. That's really important, and I I say that as someone who you you are episode I think 886 or 887 every Thursday for the last 17 years. Uh, some of the episodes are good, and some of the episodes aren't. As I'm sure some of your releases are awesome, and some of the releases aren't. But you're here, and you show up consistently, and people count on that, don't they? Having that, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Even though we call them sprints. Yeah, it's like a, a soap opera, right? You want to entertain them. You want to entertain them every Thursday. We want to entertain the community every month. And of course, to make containment enjoyable, we also enrich the the thing every month with great release notes, which the whole team writes together. Right, that we announced the feature. The release notes are worth pointing out. I don't know when they started getting really entertaining, but I feel like a couple of years ago, the release notes became even more fun. They're so dense. There's so much. I almost feel like there's features coming faster than I can memorize hotkeys, which is uh, why I use the command palette for everything now. The, the release notes is consistent, right? We had uh, animated shifts in there since a while. Yeah. And I don't think we made a change there. I mean, the, the only change that I remember more, more recently is really that uh, videos, more, more usage of videos. We had the animated chips before, right? But, but mm -hmm. that's it. But yeah, the um, it always has been, right, an, a real effort to, to make that, right? right? Uh, I mean, it, the entertainment part is one of them, right? But the other part is we, we make or we implement the features and all of this because people have been asking for them. And we think they are worthwhile to, for you to improve your productivity. So we want to make sure you know about it, right? Because what is, if we don't sell what we did, then there would have been no reason to do it, right? And, and that's why, why that is really important. And we can write huge documentation, right? Uh, but we know that there's limited audience for this. So actually having pretty much, you know, spent those 10 minutes once a month, I, I think that is extremely good time spent. Two more things. Two more things. Can I say two more things on the reason? Uh, what's also maybe people don't know, right? Even we as a team, we celebrate the release notes, right? We have an iteration goes a month. And in the last, every week we have a planning meeting. And the last planning meeting at the end of the month is where we do a joint team release notes reading. Where the item, the person reads the item that has developed with. Right. And this is really great because it shows ownership. It also shows, well, we're proud on what we do. And that's kind of how we celebrate the whole thing. The other thing we celebrate in the release notes is our contributors, right? You see at the bottom, we have this long thank you section for pull requests and also for issues. People also help us with issues. And of course, also for the pull requests. 
So it's an important vehicle for community interaction, yeah, as you observe, right? Because you read them, obviously. <laughs> I absolutely read them. I look forward to them every month. Uh, and I appreciate the, uh, the intentionality and the deliberateness of what you're describing. Another thing that you, your team does that is deliberate and focused, uh, part of your culture, is spending a quarter of your development time on reducing technical debt. You actually require that of code owners. Um, I think a lot of times people look at big companies that ship fast and they go, they're just piling features on, they're piling features on. For you to take a quarter of your time as an engineering team and say, code refactoring and architectural cleanup is important. Uh, that was a was an early uh, decision to make, to make sure that you don't get ahead of yourselves? Yeah, we had, we had experience. This is not the first open source project kind of I do together, right? So we have done projects with demo-driven for a demo, you do that and you do all add architectural depth more than what you do. So we are very sensitive to that, right? And when you want, we want to have sustainable development and want to survive for 10 years. So we learn from that, right? You make it sustainable. You have to continuously invest in a good architecture because, and also depth reduction, because if you don't do that, you can no longer run fast. Because we want to run fast and to be run fast, your code has to be fit. That's why we do that. But it's important, right? This depth reduction is really uh, not top down, right? Each developer decides what they want to do and what they want to work on. Of course, they're transparent about what they do. Sometimes they involve adoption by other team members to get some depth done. But it's really a lot of directed by the developers. They can decide what depth they want to reduce. Yeah. So we actually killed two birds with one stone here, right? The debt reduction is is one thing, right? It, it's an optimization question, right? So you can save time in the beginning to not do it, and then you pay dearly in the end, right? And would we know that overall we are faster if we do it? That's number one. But number two is this debt reduction work is actually something that, because it comes bottom up, as Eric mentioned, right, does not need an extremely intensive kind of planning exercise, right? So that means we have some spare time, so to speak, to think about what's coming in the next iteration, right? And that is also, that is actually combined top-down, bottom-up, community kind of impact, right? That is the planning part for each iteration. And the, 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 the key here is that you talk in depth with the people who know best, right? And those are the developers, right? Those are the people who, for example, had customer interviews and so on. But it needs time, right? So, and you you don't want to do this in parallel to, to all of the other work that is going on, right? So the debt week also gives us this time to have those in-depth discussions about what the next step is, what the next two to three weeks actually give us, right? So when you think about this, this is a really interesting ratio. 25% of our time go into a debt reduction. That is also the same 25% we use for planning, right? Then we have two to three weeks of actually developing. And then we have yet another week where we actually stabilize, where we test, everyone becomes a tester, everyone becomes, you know, a writer for release notes, for documentation and so on, right? So when you think about the proportionality of this, it's, uh, I think sometimes it's surprising how much effort we, for example, spent into planning for, for only running two to three weeks, right? But again, it pays off, right? Because we can look at the, the potential side effects of doing something, right? If you do, like the architecture, right? We said, oh, it was a process for, for a couple of years to get through the remote architecture, but it needed really deliberate steps along the way, right? And, and having those more intense planning discussions really allows us to do this without just doing this on the whiteboard and not have grounding in, in what people actually do on a daily basis. One point I want to make on the plan, of course, they're all transparent. We are transparent here, right? So if you haven't seen it, right, a plan is just to get a big issue. And you can read it, right? And with links to issues, whatever. And this is kind of the result of this one week effort of the discussions. And again, now the team rhythm, the first week of the iteration, we do shared plan reading, right? Where again, the owner of an item will read the item to the rest of the team. Again, kind of showing ownership, right? I'm in charge of that. That's, that's kind of the 
how can a symmetric to the end game at end game where we read the results at the beginning we read the plan for the next iteration and still a lot of effort by the team leads and the team members one-on-one -on -one discussions right that's a sweaty time for the team leads and the dev team day to day reduction well, uh, as, as I've heard you both say uh, before, culture beats strategy. And it sounds like you're building a really great culture of both community internally and externally. And uh, on behalf of developers everywhere, we thank you both for your work, your service, and thanks to the team that helps make Visual Studio Code possible. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>